Scotty Central. So here's kind of a here's kind of a question that I think needs to be asked from time to time because I wonder how many people. In fact, I know a lot of people really struggle with this issue. Does God really love me? And I'm not talking about in a general sense. You know, we we say, well, God loves people, but you know, we would also say to, oh yeah, I love everybody, and you know, I love everybody in the church, and I love everybody in the community, and maybe I think sometimes we think of God's love just sort of in a general sense like that, but I wonder if you've ever wondered, does God really love you in a real and personal sense, and if he does, What does that mean? What does it look like? Well, we are in the book of Hosea today, and um, like I told you, there's some mature themes in the book of Hosea that you're going to see, but the great thing is, I don't know of a book that paints a more beautiful picture of God's love than the book of Hosea. It's, it's, I've been so looking forward to preaching Hosea this week, and I've been so dreading preaching Hosea this week. I've been looking forward to it because of the beautiful truths, but I've been dreading it because I don't know that I can express them adequately. So we're trusting that God to do that through his word. Let's sort of take a little overview of Hosea before we jump into where I want to be. And we, were, we are going to focus in on the first three chapters, but in an overview, let me just tell you that Hosea was a prophet who ministered in the 8th century B.C., He ministered before before the northern kingdom, which is known as Israel, and which in Hosea is even called Jehu, and I'll get there in just a minute, but not really with an explanation, but we're going to look at a passage where it's described as Jehu. But he was in the northern kingdom speaking to Israel prior to the time that the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians in 722 B.C. So he prophesies or he speaks before that, And through that time, the book of Hosea explains to us the fall of Israel. If you're wondering why the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians, you can look at Hosea. We actually get God's perspective on what was going on there, and we see a vivid picture of the reason for their fall. We'll see that Baal was their biggest problem. They had begun worshiping some years before the false god Baal. In fact, it was King Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel who instituted Baal worship as the national religion of Israel. Think about that for a minute. Baal worship being the national religion for Israel. And they, of course, still kept the feasts and the festivals, and they were doing some of the stuff that was in the law that was handed down to them from Moses, and they were trying to keep some of these things, but they were just mixing everything together, and it was a mess. You might wonder how this applies to us, because probably no Baal worshipers in the room. If there are, I'd love to meet you, though, and I'd like to pick at that a little bit and probe and see why. But it's interesting in Hosea how God uses numerous analogies. Hosea, more than any other book, has all these different analogies, these different comparisons that God compares his people to. Let me give you some of the examples. He compares them to a promiscuous wife. He says, you are my betrothed and you have cheated on me. And throughout the Old Testament, idolatry is frequently referred to as a marital Infidelity. He describes them as an indifferent mother, you know, a mother that just doesn't care about her kids. He describes them as illegitimate children, and we'll see a little more of that as we go through. He describes them as an ungrateful son. He's this father that has blessed them and, and done so much for them, and they are just ingrates, and they turn on him. He describes them as a stubborn cow. Now, <clears throat> I was writing my sermon and preparing to talk about stubborn cows, and I thought, what are you thinking? You're talking to a room full of ranchers. And I, like I told you, I got to go. I don't need you coming up correcting me on my cowology today. So I called my rancher friend, Patrick. And I said, Patrick, how smart are cows? And Patrick says, you know, they're a lot smarter than people think. And I thought, really? And I said, well, have you ever met a stubborn cow? He said, oh, yeah. I said, well, tell me about stubborn cows. 
And he started explaining how different breeds are more prone to be stubborn than other kinds of breeds. And you'll get a heifer over here and she gets real stubborn. And I didn't catch any of that. But what I got is that every now and then you get a stubborn heifer. And this stubborn heifer doesn't want to go in the chute. And I said, well, why doesn't she want to go in the chute? He says, well, that's where she goes to get her injections and things like that. And so she doesn't want that, even though it's good for her. And he said, she'll just go lay down and not move. But he said, here's the problem with the stubborn cow that won't do what's good for her. If she goes and lays down and she actually is so strong-willed, she becomes the leader. And she entices other cows to be stubborn and not do what they are supposed to do. And do you know what Patrick said? Patrick said a stubborn cow usually winds up in the sale barn meeting an early demise. <laughs> now, those of you that know Patrick know he didn't say meeting an early demise. Those are Mike's words. But this was Israel. Israel would not submit to God. They would not do what God told them, even though it was in their own best interest, even though it was for their own good, and they were actually leading other people astray. And they're going to pay for it. They're going to wind up in the sale barn. He compares them to a silly dove. Now, I know a thing or two about a silly dove. You say, why do you know about that? I'm a bird hunter. I like hunting birds. I grew up hunting birds. But here's what I grew up hunting most, blue quail and a little bit of pheasant. But blue quail are so much fun to hunt out in West Texas where it's flat because they run on the ground and you, tra you actually track them. So blue quail are hard to find, they're hard to see, and I kid you not, you can be walking along out there and walk right by a covey of 20 quail. And after you walk by them, they'll flush. That's what a pheasant does. Man, you can nearly step on a pheasant before it flushes. But here's the thing about a quail and a pheasant. When they flush, they fly in a nice straight line, you get a bead, and they're just not that hard to shoot. Dove, on the other hand, hang out in public, don't they? They'll sit on the power lines, but when they fly, what do they do? Man, they flip all over the place, and a dove's, dove's hard to hit on the fly. And that's what Israel was like. He tells them, you're flitting about like a silly dove going back and forth between Egypt and Assyria. And why is that so silly? Because one minute they're looking to Egypt to protect them, and one minute they're looking to Assyria to protect them, when all they need is to be obedient to God, and he's going to protect them. Silly doves. He compares them to grapes in the wilderness, actually a positive analogy, because basically he says, I, I got you in the wilderness, and you were, this, you were this bountiful fruit that someone stumbles across in the wilderness. He compares them to a wild donkey wandering alone in the wilderness. And then he compares them in chapter 10 to a luxuriant vine. Now, again, what do I know about vines? So I called my friend Marnell, who owns a vineyard. And I said, Marnell, I want to have a conversation with you. I'm studying for my sermon, and God calls his people a luxuriant vine, and it's not a positive thing. Do you have anything to say about that? She says, oh boy, do I. Now I know I'm on to something, right? I took a page in notes talking to Marnell. And Marnell says, here's the problem. When a vine is, is resting easy and it's getting plenty of nutrients and it's just allowed to grow, it becomes this luxuriant vine. And she says, now understand, she doesn't really believe a vine thinks, okay? She says, but now it thinks it doesn't need to produce fruit. It has everything it needs, and so it becomes so luxuriant that it becomes worthless, and she says, you have to keep a vine under stress. It has to work because when it's under stress and dependent, it goes into reproduction mode because it knows it needs to reproduce fruit in order to survive. And then she starts talking about these things called canes. Now, some of you know what this is, but the cane is the part that comes off the trunk of the vine. And she says you have to prune the canes because if you just let all of it bear fruit, then what will happen is it will start bearing fruit and there aren't enough nutrients and it doesn't produce good fruit. So you have to prune the parts that's going to produce bad fruit. She said, in fact, some of these canes, she called it a bull cane, will go 30 feet away. And she said the further it gets away from the vine, the less fruit it will produce and the more worthless it is. Sounds a lot like Jesus in John chapter 15, doesn't it? When Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, apart from me, you can do nothing. And if you're not producing fruit, he says, what are you good for? But to be chopped off and thrown into fire. And that's what the vine is. So what's happening here is this is exactly what happened with Israel as they became worthless. And this was actually, this was a warning given to them by Moses back in, where was it? I wrote it down. 
Back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, when they were getting ready to go in the promised land, Moses warned and says, now be careful when you go into this promised land, houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant, and everything's going to be great. And you're going to become comfortable and satisfied and forget how much you need God. And then your hearts will go astray. It's exactly what happened. How many of y'all have ever heard somebody say, well, as it says in the Bible, God will never give you more than you can handle. You ever heard that? That is not in the Bible. You know what's in the Bible? The opposite of that. God continues to give us more than we can handle. Why does he give us more than we can handle? So that we will realize our utter dependency on him because he doesn't give us anything he can't handle. So yeah, we have to live under stress if we're going to be dependent on him and be healthy and bear fruit. We need to be careful. So he uses all these numerous analogies, but the most prevalent analogy all the way through Hosea is the most shocking analogy, and that's the analogy of prostitution. He says, in effect, what you've done is prostitution. You've prostituted yourselves with Baal. Now, why would God use such crude language? I'll tell you two reasons. One is I think his intention is to shock them. Because I think a lot of times, you know, we think our sin, oh yeah, it's a little bad, but it's not that big deal. You know, at least I'm not doing this, right? We compare our sin to other people. And the way God sees our sin is much more horrific than the way we see it. And he's shocking his people. But this is actually also the way he sees it. He says, you're my bride and you have sold yourself into an adulterous relationship with a God that is no God at all. This is the main analogy. By the way, can I just tell you that, that the, the, uh, the, the captivity worked? If you read the Old Testament, what happens, man? From, from before the time they get in the promised land till the time they get in the promised land, they're constantly chasing after false gods. The northern kingdom falls in 722 to the Assyrians. The southern kingdom falls in 586 to the Babylonians because of idolatry. And do you know that after their captivity, when they come back to the promised land, we never see records of them committing idolatry like that again. In the time of Jesus in the New Testament, do we see the Jews worshiping idols? No, what they had done is the pendulum had swung. The pendulum had swung from this licentious, anything goes, to a harsh and deadly legalism. But God fixed their idolatry problem, idolatry problem with all of this. This main analogy, prostitution, we're going to see it in the first three chapters and then it's described in the rest of the book. But this analogy is lived by Hosea. See, God chooses Hosea to be a living parable. A parable is a a story describing or exemplifying who God is like or what God is like, what his character is like. And this is a painful parable because it involves Hosea's family. So we're going to see a living parable. He calls Hosea. He says, I want people to see through your life exactly how it is with me and my people. Hosea's calling is to live a life that demonstrates a relationship between God and his people. Now, first thing, Hosea gets married. God God picks him a wife. You say, well, that sounds great. God, just pick you a wife. That's great. Not so fast. Hosea 1, verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, And have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Man. Hosea, you're going to go marry this woman that's a prostitute. You're going to bring her into your home. You're going to make her your wife. And she's going to continue to be a prostitute. And she's going to have children out of that prostitution. I want you to think back when you got married. How many of you were envisioning something like that on your wedding day? Can you imagine? This is what Hosea knows going in. You know what I do with a a lot of times when I talk to married couples who are having trouble? I said, I want you to go back. I want you to spend time thinking about when y'all used to like each other. You know? I want you to go back and I want you to camp out and remember what drew you to one another. I want you to remember the dreams that you had for your marriage. Let's rekindle some of that. Hosea never had any of those dreams, did he? Go get a wife of whoredom, have children of whoredom. 
My goodness. But this is the way it was with God and Israel. In Joshua 24, they had gone into the promised land. They'd been conquering cities. This is interesting. A lot of you people, you have this, have this uh, maybe on some artwork, have this phrase, choose you this day whom you will serve as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know the context of that? He's looking at these people who are already worshiping idols. They're new in the promised land. They're already worshiping idols. He said, you need to make a choice. He says, you need to decide whether you're going to worship the false gods from beyond the river or the false gods in this land. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Isn't that interesting? He's telling them, make a choice between which idols you're going to serve. And then they responded and said, oh, no, 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 no. We, we're going to follow God. And you know what he says? You're not able. You're not going to. Now, I want you to think about that. God put them in the promised land, knowing ahead of time they were going to betray him, knowing they were going to commit spiritual adultery. He puts them there. He blesses them, knowing why does he do that? Why did he bless them? He answered that in Deuteronomy chapter 7. He says, why did I choose you from all the nations of the earth? Why did I decide to bless you and none of the other nations? He says, it wasn't because you were so great. He said, it's because I decided to set my love on you. Friends, God does not save us because we're good. You know what else? God doesn't save us because he knows we're going to be good after he saves us. In fact, this is why I hear a lot of things. You know, God looks down the corridors of the time and he saves those people that are going to be really good Christians. <laughs> what? No. He knows us. He knows us. So it's just the opposite. He knows full well who we are, and he loves us anyway. You know, that, that causes me to ask, why would we ever look down on other people? Why do we rail against people's sin? You know, why do we rail against those people outside the church? Oh, look at those non-Christians, how they act and behave. It's as if we think that we're Christians because we're special. We're Christians because we're better. And that's not the case at all. But you know what? I, th I found there's this spiritual pride sometimes in the church. And you know where I see it? I see it on social media with people going, I am proud to be a Christian. I proudly kneel before the cross. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Proudly kneel. Well, kneeling is supposed to be a sign of humility, not pride. We can't take pride in the fact that God decided to love us even though we didn't deserve to be loved. We should be the most humble, gracious, and kind people on the planet. We should never be angry, frustrated, complain. So Hosea in marrying Gomer, that's her name, by the way, Gomer. In marrying Gomer, he was actually with his life painting a picture of God's grace. And then things get bad. You know they're going to get bad, right? I mean, it's a recipe for disaster. God tells him it's going to be bad. He was very good to her, and they had a son. And God said, name the son Jezreel. Now, this is interesting. He says, name the son Jezreel because I'm going to cause my people to pay for the blood of Jezreel. Now, what's the blood of Jezreel? Ahab, remember, Ahab is the one that instituted Baal worship as the national religion. He didn't come up with Baal worship. He just said it was the national religion. He made it sort of the official thing. There was a man who lived in Jezreel named Naboth, and he had a vineyard. And Ahab really wanted the vineyard, and he was pouting because Naboth wouldn't give it to him. So Ahab's sweet wife Jezebel says, go take the vineyard and kill the guy. So he did. And he spilled that blood at Jezreel. And you need to know that this is a long time later, but God is bringing recompense for that upon these people. So they have Jezreel. Then they have two more kids. They have a girl and a boy. God names them also. He names the girl lo ru and he names the boy Lo-Ami. Weird names, right? They're real weird when you think that the girl's name actually translates no mercy, and the boy's name is not my people. God is trying to demonstrate that the children of Israel are illegitimate children. Now, I want you to put yourself in Hosea's shoes. He's got this woman. He loves her. They have a child together. Then she comes home pregnant 
from her life of prostitution. Twice. Well, how does this apply to us? We don't worship Baal, right? You know what the New Testament says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5? It doesn't mention Baal, but it says that all of our ungodly desires, all of our passions, all of our desires to sin at their root are idolatry. You see, all sin is ultimately a dissatisfaction with God. All sin, I am deciding God's way is not best for me. This way is going to bring me more happiness, joy, satisfaction, peace of mind than going God's way. And it's idolatry. It is rejecting God for something or someone else. God calls that whoredom, and he hates it. Think about this. You know, we don't like to talk about God hating things or people or anything like that, but parents, how badly do you hate the sin in your children's lives? And why do you hate it? You hate it so much because you love them so much. You know, think about this. Parents, you know, you say you've got a teenager and one of your, you know, you know somebody that's got a teenager says, oh man, I just caught my teenager doing this. You know, I found out my teenager's been out drinking or I found out my teenager's been sleeping around or I found out this. And how do you feel? You feel really bad for them, right? You're like, oh man, I hate that for you. It's really bad. But then what happens when it happens to your kids? It's way different, isn't it? Because you can't stand the thought of your own kids doing something like that. Why? Why is it so meaningful? Because you love them so dearly. And God is reacting so violently here. God is reacting with such passion because of the passionate love that he has for his people. The illustration of prostitution is such a fitting description. You know, when we lived in New Orleans... um, we live in New Orleans, you know, the greater metro area. We weren't in the center part of New Orleans, but between our house and church was not a good neighborhood. And just, what, about three blocks from the church was a corner where some prostitutes would hang out. And uh, sometime, you know, I'd, I go to work. I, I get to church around 6 o'clock Sunday morning, and so, you know, it'd be still dark, and they're hanging out on the corner. And it just broke my heart. Every time, I, I had a hard time looking at it, it just broke my heart. Because you know what I'd think of? I'd, I'd have a couple of thoughts. Where's her daddy? What kind of relationship did she have or not have with a father? But here's what I always thought. How little self-worth, how low self-esteem, how little does that woman have to think of herself to earn money by doing what she's doing. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? Well, how low does our own worth have to be and how low does our view of God have to be for us to turn on our backs on the one who loves us and chase after things that will never satisfy? So God hates our sin, and this brings us to the point, really brings us up to the main part, the the main point. The main point is not their unfaithfulness. Now, God has to highlight and show graphically what their unfaithfulness is in order to get to the main point of Hosea, and the main point of Hosea is God's relentless love. Hosea chapter 2. This is honestly one of my favorite short passages in all the Bible because of one word. Hosea 2, verse 13. It's two verses I want you to look at. And by the way, your your Bible probably has a break and a little title in there. That that shouldn't even be there. That was added. That's not in the original manuscripts. Hosea 2, 13. I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals. When she burned offerings to them, adorned herself with ring and jewelry, went after her lovers, and forgot me, declares the Lord. And then, if you are one to write in your Bible, I want you to circle the word therefore in verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. This is stunning to me. What does God say? She burned offerings to the Baal. She adorned herself with that jewelry. She went after her lover. She totally forgot me. But even though she did all those things, I'm going to go get her back. No, you know what God says? She betrayed me. She chased after these these horrible things and this horrible life. Therefore, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go get her. Because. 
was. She has gone so far from me. I'm going to go get her. And how am I going to go get her? I'm going to speak sweetly. And I'm going to draw her and allure her. Bring her back to me. So the next thing we see is that Hosea buys her back. She had sold herself into sexual slavery to a man who could profit from her. And look at what God says in Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And the Lord said to me, go again. Go again. Love a woman who's loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. Though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her, Hosea says. For 15 shekels of silver and a homer and letic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be with you. She sold herself. It's crazy. What woman would do that? Yeah, it is, right? It's crazy. Who would turn their backs on God, right? But there's more here. In this time, you know what the price for a bond servant was? 30 shekels of silver. 30 shekels of silver. Hosea pays 15 shekels of silver and a little barley. What's going on here? Here's the thing. This is not a young, beautiful woman anymore. She was living this lifestyle before he married her. She continued living that lifestyle. She goes full abandon back into that lifestyle. And by this point in her life, she's only worth half price. She's worn out. She's used up. She's no longer valuable. And she's without hope. You can only imagine the misery that she's living in, can't you? And one day her husband shows up and says, how much for her? And he buys her. And he embraces her. And he loves her. And he says, you don't do this anymore. You're going to be mine and I'm going to be yours. You're going to be mine and I'm going to be yours. This is the most beautiful picture of the gospel I think we can see in Scripture. Romans chapter 3 says that we are all filthy and without hope. And Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says that we too have been purchased. We have been purchased, but he says not with something as cheap and tawdry and worthless as gold and silver. We've been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And and then 1 Peter chapter 2 actually intentionally draws on Hosea. You remember? These children, not my people and no mercy. And 1 Peter chapter 2 says, we were once not a people and now we're God's people. And once we had no mercy and now we have mercy. I heard about something that just really aggravated me and I I don't know. I don't, even think, I don't know if I've asked Kobe about this. We didn't talk about it this week, but at least for a time several years ago, I heard that, that speakers at youth and college events and singles events were using this rose analogy in their sermons. Of course, you know, singles and youth events, you've got to talk about sexual purity, right? I mean, that's, I wonder if they ever get tired of hearing it. Um, even though they need to hear it. I still wonder if they ever get tired of hearing it. And so what what a speaker would do, this was sort of like in the playbook for a while, is he would take a rose, a long stem rose, and at the beginning of his sermon, he would walk over to one side of the room and he would 
say, take this rose, I want you to pass it around while I'm speaking, and I want you to smell it, I want you to feel it, I want you to rub the petals, I want you to feel the leaves, I want you to get real acquainted, and I want you to pass it around. And then he would, he would speak about sexual purity, and then at the end, he would say, now where's my rose? And he would get the rose, and of course, by this time, what's that rose look like? He has missing petals, and it's all broken, and looks awful, and he wants to make the point that if you're, you're letting people handle you, then no man's going to want you, young woman. No lady's going to want you, young man. And that's the, that's the point. So he'd take the rose and he'd go, now who would want this? So here's what I want to do. If you're, a, if you're a teenager or a single or a college student and you're ever in a place and you see a guy start with that, I want you just to get ready. And at the end, when he holds up the rose, that's all broken. And he says, now who would want that rose? I want you to say, Jesus wants the rose. Jesus does. Jesus wants the broken, the bent, the wasted, the used up, the ugly, the terrible. Not only does he want it, he has purchased those of us, those of us who are dirty, filthy, used up, broken, and without hope. Does God love you? Really? Really, does he love you? Listen, here's our takeaway today. You ready for this? You are loved beyond your wildest dreams. Maybe you see yourself as so unlovely that you're beyond hope. Well, guess what? You don't even realize how bad you are. We never realize the depth of our depravity, how bad it really is. We never see our sin as vile as God sees it. But I want you to listen to this quote from Tim Keller. I love this. The gospel is this. You listening? The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe, yet at the very same time we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. No matter who you are or what you've done, you are valuable to God. And he paid a steep, steep price. He didn't pay half price for you. He paid premium price for you. He paid for you with the blood of his very own son. That's how much he loves you. Does God love you? Really? You are loved beyond your wildest dreams. Would you turn to him? Would you run to him? Because he says, you don't have to do that anymore. I will be yours and you will be mine. Let us pray. Oh God, we can't, we can't even imagine the depth of your love. We try to imagine it, and I know that we're just barely getting beyond the surface. We can't imagine the depth of our depravity. And we certainly can't imagine that your love goes even deeper than that. And we thank you for loving us enough to go buy us, to purchase us out of the slavery that we have chosen to sell ourselves into. And I pray for people in this room that have doubted your love, that today they would realize it and embrace it. For people in this room who think they've been beyond your love, that they would see that when we sell ourselves out, Therefore, you allure us, draw us back. And I pray that people in this room would come running to you today so that they would know what it's like to belong to you, the good husband who loves with an unfailing and relentless love. We pray this in Jesus' name.